Well, good morning, and uh, <coughs> it's great to see that uh, some people have stayed the course, and uh, <laughs> uh, I hope it's not on my accent and on my ideas that have sent some people I know having to go home, but it's nice to have some people to discuss my final stage of my, my storytelling uh, about Galilee. Uh, we began with looking at it as a Hellenistic and Roman period, then we tried to yesterday to, to see Jesus within the context that we had been talking about the previous day, and today I wanted to, rather tentatively I have to say, uh, suggest the beginnings of early Christianity within Galilee itself. Uh, I think that uh, we're beginning now to see that perhaps uh, very often the, 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 the rise and, uh, and spread of Christianity uh, has it been very much determined by Luke's account of Paul taking over, as it were, and bringing the gospel to Rome. But of course, uh, we know that the gospel went in other directions as well, and unfortunately we can't trace those very much. So scholars have to find ways of filling the, filling the pages, and uh, this is my effort at, at beginning to do that, anyhow. Uh, <clears throat> so just to, to begin very briefly, in the previous two lectures, the focus has been on the study of Galilee from two different perspectives. One, understanding the impact of Hellenization and Romanization on Galilean society by the first century of the Common Era. And secondly, assessing the significance of Galilee as the theater and matrix for Jesus' ministry. In this third lecture, we remain in Galilee, searching now for the beginnings of early Christian theologizing about Jesus there. The Synoptic Gospels have been used in both the previous talks as one of the literary sources that can be critically utilized, especially in our search for the Galilean Jesus. Despite a prevailing skepticism in New Testament scholarship, it has been claimed that when these narratives are read against the background of the social and religious world of Galilee, as this has been constructed from the sources and, and from archaeology, the Gospels, especially the Gospel of Mark, does measure up well in terms of both local colouring and contextual plausibility with regard to the manner in which Jesus' ministry in Galilee is represented. That word represented, I think, is important. It's making present again at one level, but also it, it, it allows for the author's, as it were, own particular concerns. Despite this historical very, very similitude with regard to Jesus and Galilee, it must also be recognized that all three synoptics were written in the final third of the first century and were intended to address issues facing the early Jesus movement as it came to terms with the destruction of Jerusalem and his temple, Mark, the developing conflict with the synagogue and scribal Judaism, Matthew, and the need to locate itself as favorably as possible within the Roman imperial situation, Luke. At least those are my three suggestions for the or the, the focal point of the three Gospels. To borrow an image from photography, of which I'm, not, I'm no expert, there's a kind of double exposure operative in the Gospels, namely one, one to the world of Jesus and one to the world of the first Christians. The latter superimposed on the former for obvious historical and theological reasons that seek, seek to stress continuity between the pre- and post-Easter phases of the tradition. Each needs to be examined critically and separately, since the same stories may have quite different significance within the frameworks of the two storylines that can be discerned through careful and critical investigation and decipherment in the, in the Gospels. The storyline of Jesus and the storyline of the evangelist. In other words, creative development of tradition cannot be ruled out for the later period. Now, the question I want to address today, the question of an early Galilean Christianity, has been widely discussed for several reasons. Uh, while there are few, if any, traces of such to be found in the archaeological remains from the first century, there's plenty of evidence of Christian churches in the region from the post-Constantinian period onwards, and sometimes even side by side with the remains of Jewish synagogues from the same period, as, for example, in Capernaum. At Capernaum, the Franciscan excavators have postulated a first century house church, a Domus Ecclesiae, underneath the 6th century octagonal basilica in which it is alleged the Jewish Christian community had met for the first time. So I have a few slides that will give you some idea of this, I think. This is just a first slide to show you uh, some of the houses, if you like. In, uh, at the back you can see the synagogue, but these are some of the little basalt uh, houses uh, of, of, it, uh, of the first century in Capernaum. Now, uh, this is, a, this is the first, uh, the house of Peter, as they call it, first century isometric view. Uh, you can see the dark um, uh, sign there to show it's in the center of a cluster of houses, really, uh, Peter, where Peter supposedly has, has, um, 
uh, had uh, dined with his mother-in-law, having cured her, first of all, of a fever. Uh, now, that particular, what, what make, the argument of the Franciscans is that this, this particular building received considerable attention subsequently in the third century, and you can see what has happened here with it. It has been divided into two, and there's been kind of a, a, an atrium put, put in front of it, and uh, with a, a, divided into two into an archway, and some other side room. It has been divided also in terms of side rooms. But on top of that, the floor was, was uh, uh, given a, a very different to the floors in the other houses. It was much more, more uh, I think, a stone, or a stone finish, as I recall. And then finally, there was also a, a number of plaster things found that are, uh, none of these actually are any representations of, 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 of writing. But they do claim that some of them have a, a key, key, key row on, on them as well. So that's the really argument for continuity from the first century to the third century archaeologically in the house of Peter, the Domus Ecclesiae. Then, of course, in the Byzantine period, there was a, a large uh, octagonal basilica built over that. And so there's that, that continuity. And today, of course, we have, uh, well, I'm not, I, won't, I won't describe it for you. If you've been there, you've, you know what it looked like, looks like. And it's not very pleasant, I think. Uh, in my, in my view, I wouldn't have allowed that to have happened, but there you are. Some people have done that. Uh, okay. Apart from the, that, that little bit of archaeological evidence, if you like, from the first century, uh, we have also some references to, in the rabbinic texts uh, to followers of the Galilean Jesus followers. Uh, for example, um, we hear, once I was walking along the main street of Sepphoris, and I met Ye Jacob of Kefir Shikin, and he said to me a word of minute, in the name of Yeshua ben Panter Pantiri, and it pleased me. And uh, this is Rabbi Eliezer, who was, uh, had been excommunicated because he was se seen to have agreed with the heretics, and he's very, been very upset about it and examining his conscience and so on. And he remembers meeting this, this, uh, this healer, this uh, Jacob of Kefir Shikin, uh, with maybe the Shikin that we talked about uh, close to Sepphoris, actually a village close to Sepphoris the other day in terms of pottery making. The other one is the case of Rabbi Eliezer ben Dama, whom a serpent bit. There came a Jacob, a man of Kefir Sama. So it could be the same person, but his, uh, uh, rabbinic literature is notoriously vague in terms of place and time and so on. To cure him in the name of Yeshua ben Pandira. But Rabbi Ishmael did not allow it. Uh, as you know, in the tradition, there was the tradition that we find it later in the Toledot Yeshua, that's already mentioned by, uh, by origin, that Jesus was the son of a Roman soldier, Pantera. So we can see some references to that here in, in, in those images. Uh, okay. Uh, finally, later church fathers uh, speak... Uh, uh, I'm not quite sure why I put that, that particular description from Caesarea in there, how it got in. Uh, finally, um, uh, the later church fathers speak of Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish um, uh, Christian sects, such as the Ebionites and the Nazareans, operating in the Galilean and Transjordan regions. These uh, they regard as heretical in the light of later doctrinal developments. The question then is whether there might be any continuity between these later uh, groups, like the Ebionites and the Nazareans, whose gospels we hear about and so on from Epiphanius and others, and the putative communities of Jesus followers in the region from the first century. In this lecture, I will concentrate on the latter question, uh, since uh, the possibility of identifying first century CE communities of Jesus followers in Galilee is by no means universally accepted. The most likely access to these communities is deemed to be through, the, uh, through some of the earliest New Testament writings, namely Mark's Gospel and this putative document Q. I presume everybody knows what Q is supposed to be. It's this collection of sayings of Jesus that uh, was used uh, independently by both Matthew and uh, Luke subsequently and is deemed to have been an early collection of the sayings of Jesus. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a document or a putative document that has received considerable attention. In fact, as I was sitting in the, in the library, uh, the Dean's Library, just briefly uh, this morning, I picked up a, 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 a number of a, a journal of New Testament studies, and the first article in it was uh, examining the hypothesis Q. So, so I, have to, I have to preface anything I say about Q with the, with the very clear indication that it is a, an hypothesis. But on the, on the whole, I think it, it makes better sense than alternatives, to, for me at least, in terms of uh, explaining the collection of Jesus' sayings and their use in early Christianity subsequently. Uh, 
Behind these uh, writing, uh, Q and Mark, uh, as I say, are the two that we're going to look at. Behind these uh, two writings stand different Galilean communities, it is claimed. Two questions arise in that event. One, what are the arguments for allocating one or both of these documents and their communities to Galilee? And two, what difference would that conclusion make? Well, to answer the, f the second question first, uh, the difference it would make, it seems to me, and this is a point I was trying to emphasize yesterday, if we could be confident that the earliest form of the uh, Christian myth-making about Jesus took place in Galilee. Uh, it, is, it, the, the importance of that is that such a conclusion would have profound implications for the conduct and content of Christian theology today. It, not merely the, the conduct uh, of it, but also the conduct for preaching and Christian praxis. It would underline the need to include the concrete realities of Jesus' life in a particular time and place, namely Galilee, as an integral part of the Christian proclamation, rather than merely being treated as a presupposition, as Bultmann famously claimed. We've touched on that, I think, yesterday as well. <clears throat> uh, 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 Bultmann, of course, regard the Gospels as essentially mythical and legendary, the product of a faith-inspired interpretation of events. As a result, the message needed to be translated into a modern idiom if it was to function properly uh, as, as a proclamation of the Gospel of Jesus Christ for the 20th century. However, this meant that the Christian message was de denuded of its actuality in terms of the historical reality of people's lives, then and now, in favour of a contemporary version that often smacked of philosophical idealism, as Bultmann's uh, own case, namely the existential categories of Martin Heidegger. Anyhow, uh, we'll come back to that point at the end again. It, 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 it could be uh, counter to, to my claims about idealism and Bultmann and so on that uh, the study of the historical Jesus has long abandoned Bult Bultmann's scepticism, so that now in the so-called third wave we have as many different Jesus as there are authors all of them giving, uh, giving a new slant to the actualities of his life, everything from social revolutionary to cynic philosopher and uh, myst or mystic or whatever else in between. However, unlike the 19th century liberal quest for the historical Jesus, the target of Bultmann, the target of Bultmann's skeptical reaction, the present so-called third quest is often conducted in ways that seek to retrieve the historical figure of Jesus independently of his relationship with the movement that emerged in his name. Both are seriously reductionist in my view, the Bultmannian position ignores the importance of the actuality of Jesus' life for an adequate theology of the New Testament, and more recent trends often seek to discover a Jesus without Christianity. The, the advantage of seeking a via media between scepticism and historicism is that it would seek to bridge the gap between the Jesus of history and the Christ of faith, an issue that has bedeviled so much Christological th thinking since the 18th century. A focus on Galilee would provide one means of avoiding the cul -de -sac, previous cul-de-sacs by claiming that the world which shaped and challenged Jesus' own response to his situation should be recognized as playing an equally important role in his followers' remembering of him, while at the same time also influencing their reconfiguration of the story of his life in relation to the concrete situation of their time and their place. In other words, local continuity can point to a further continuities in terms of belief and praxis. I would like to explore this suggestion by focusing on two, these two important aspects of New Testament Christology, namely Jesus' messiahship in the Gospel of Mark and his role as teacher of wisdom in Q. Each of these emerged as contested images for him during his lifetime and both became the subject of special attention in the Gospel of Mark and the Q document subsequently. It is worth noting that each of the synoptic writers uh, wants to underline the divinely inspired importance of Jesus' Galilean ministry. They all agree that it was only after the arrest of John that Jesus moves to Galilee, thus associating his ministry with that of the one who is described as the Elijah who was to come. Matthew in particular is particularly emphatic, applying to, uh, two of his fulfillment of scripture texts to the significance of Galilee. I think we saw one of them the last day. The other has to do with uh, Jesus' arrival in Nazareth, around which he plays on the, on the prophecy from Isaiah about the shoot from Jesse and so on, and that's uh, yeah, Then... Uh, Mark uh, notes that Jesus coming into Galilee proclaims the arrival of the eschatological uh, uh, kingly rule of God uh, and, and, that this was, uh, and that it was a sign that the fulfillment of time, the kairos, had been fulfilled and then had finally arrived, Mark 1.14. Uh, <clears throat> Luke uses the equally pregnant term, the arche, or beginning, to highlight the fact that Jesus' ministry in Galilee uh, would eventually take him on a journey to Jerusalem. Mark, uh, and, 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 and that, that he's arrived in Galilee, marks an important new moment in human history. 
uh, anarchy. Entering into the spirit of the text, it is clear that the, evangelist, uh, that the evangelist Jesus Galilean ministry was no accidental happening. Galilee was a divinely foretold theater for Jesus. It was the place of manifestation of the eschatological event of God's saving act, which could also be seen as a new beginning for humanity, a new creation, in fact. So I'm suggesting there that if we read those texts, if you like, the, be the way the, min the beginning of the ministry in Galilee is presented in the Gospels, uh, the evangelists have already begun to see that it has a theological as well as a purely historical significance. Now, my, before we kind of get on to look at our two uh, texts, Q and Mark, I'd like to fill in the, a little bit of historical background. <laughs> what happened between uh, the uh, death of Jesus and the revolt against Rome in, in, uh, uh, of, of the Jews, Jewish revolt against Rome in 66? Can we fill in that picture for Galilee in particular? And the problem is that it's not very easy. The, our, our sources are, are, are a little bit um, uh, partial and often uh, uh, very little evidence. And of course, in the case of archaeology, it's hard to date things so precisely to a decade or anything like that. As one archaeologist once said to me, uh, if we get things as close as 100 years, we're doing quite well. So we have to be careful about, about the way we use archaeology, of course, as well. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Uh, um, just um, trying to make it a little bit quicker here. Our independent sources for this period are very explicit, uh, are not very explicit, but nevertheless we can detect general trends that explain the situation that is present in the late 60s, when again Galilee comes directly into view in Josephus' account, especially his own account of his own sojourn in the region as a leader of, of one of the revolutionary parties. With Antipas' deposition as ruler in Galilee in the year 39 of the Common Era, Antipas lived on, uh, he was deposed eventually, the region's relative independence as an administrative district came to an end, with its integration into the united Judean kingdom of Agrippa I. Agrippa I was a, a nephew of, of Antipas. Uh, but his brief reign uh, ended with his death in the year 44 of the Common Era. He's mentioned in Acts of the Apostles, incidentally. Thereafter, Galilee was integrated into an enlarged Roman province of, of Judea, the rump of which had been established in the southern part of the country on the deposition of Ar Archelaus. Oh, so that's why I, had, uh, I was getting ahead of myself. This inscription from Caesarea about, uh, about Pontius Pilate. You can see Tiberium, uh, and then you can see something about Pontius Pilatus there. Now, I, pref Prefectus is a prefect. Uh, but... Uh, we often talk about the Roman province, but it, it really wasn't a Roman province. It was a procuratorship, and recent studies suggest that uh, that term doesn't have to, have to mean a full, as it were, um, uh, apparatus of Roman administration in, in the region, but uh, rather that it comes under uh, another uh, larger province, namely uh, the province of Syria. This suggests that Rome was well aware of the fact that Jewish nationalist aspirations were bubbling beneath the surface already. Nero introduced further administrative changes in the year 56 of the Common Era, when eastern Lower Galilee, that is the part around the lake, centered in Tariqi and Tiberias, uh, and their top, top archies, a term we met yesterday as well, was, were, were given over to Agrippa II, uh, another nephew of, of the... From, from, uh, uh, sorry, Agrippa II was the son of Agrippa I, uh, so he's a grandnephew of Herod the Great. He was the last of the Herodian rulers whose territory at that time included the region of Transjordan and Upper Galilee around Caesarea Philippi. Uh, and so I think that was why I just, that that's, gives you some idea, the valley region that was now part of, uh, of the, uh, the territory of Philip. Um, in brief, the Roman administrative net was tightening in this period in anticipation of, of, but also giving rise to Jewish unrest. This would eventually embroil the whole, whole of the country in open revolt, for strategic reasons, Galilee would, would bear the brunt of the onslaught of Roman troops from Syria, and undoubtedly there was widespread disruption of social life and denuding of the resources of the region. People flocked from the countryside to the major strongholds. Jotapata, we mentioned it yesterday, in the centre of Galilee, uh, in Lower Galilee, and Gamla in the Golan, the town we saw yesterday as well. The former f fell to Vespasian, that is, Jotapata fell to Ves Vespasian after a lengthy siege in the spring of 67 during which Josephus himself surrendered to the Romans. Gamla was subsequently taken with major loss of life in, his, in the mopping up operation before Vespasian turned his attention to the south, to Jerusalem in particular. 
I think I've, uh, yes. This is a, 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 a from Gamla, where the Roman breach can be seen very clearly uh, there on the wall. Uh, and the houses behind had been uh, filled with stone and so on to protect the wall more fully, and you can see that today still. So it's quite an interesting. Uh, Gamla is the most interesting site, but it needs a lot more archaeological work to, to, to uh, reveal all the details of Judean life that we'd like to know about in Galilee. Uh, here are some of the, the ballistae that were used by the Romans, the Roman catapults from Gamla as well. And now also finally contrasting pottery from Gamla. We'll come back to this later. Uh, you see on the one side the, the plain saucers and bowls locally made, found, uh, found in Galilee. So on the right hand side as you look at it. But then the top, the red slip uh, plates and bowls made in, uh, on the Phoenician coast found in Gamla in the first century. None of these are to be found in lo loci dating to the first century. So that's, it's on the base of that, and I'll be coming back to it later, that, uh, that Andrea Berlin in particular argues for a change of attitude, if you like, and a more inward-looking attitude in, uh, in the Judaism in, in, in a place like Gamla. Of course, we saw also about the coin that is struck, uh, namely in a Paleo-Hebrew script, uh, 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 talking about for the redemption of Zion, Jerusalem the Holy. Uh, <clears throat> The net result of these changes and tensions was to have a profound effect on religious realities also, especially in view of the central role that the temple and land played in Judean religious uh, systems. Uh, <clears throat> the anti-Roman feelings that can be detected in the archaeological remains of these two highly significant sites, that is, Gamla and Jotapata, had uh, their roots deep in Jewish monotheistic tradition that could not tolerate the increasing signs of deification of the Roman emperor, especially Gaius Caligula and Nero. The former had already created a major crisis in 41 of the Common Era with his wish to have a statue of himself erected in the Jerusalem Temple. Agrippa I, who was a friend of Gaius, Caligula, was able to avert the crisis by delaying the matter sufficiently until he passed away. Any such threat of violation of the Jerusalem Sanctuary was bound to arouse memories of Antiochus Epiphanes' desecration of the Holy Place in the mid-2nd century BCE and Pompey's entry, Pompey the Great's entry into the, into the Temple in the 1st century. Jewish national, nationalism and Jewish monotheism came together to resist any such syncretism. No Lord but God was the slogan uh, of, one, of one of the more militant part, uh, groups. This was in sharp contrast to the process of honouring the various emperors in all the surrounding Greco-Roman cities in Syria, Phoenicia and the Decapolis region, through their identification with some of the newer gods and heroes of the Roman pantheon, the ones we've been looking at, Dionysus, Heracles, Pan, Asclepius, Hermes and so on. Uh, <clears throat> When a Roman centurion is credited in by Mark with professing that Jesus was a divi filius, a son of God, uh, he was reflecting something of the prevailing religious ethos of, Roman, of the Roman world. Uh, there's a coin of uh, divi filius, Roman emperor and son. Now, I'd like to be able to tell you that what emperor and what son that is, but I'm not absolutely sure. And I, I suspect that Professor, uh, Professor uh, Attridge may have a copy of this coin in his collection. <laughs> so I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not going to chance my arm today. <laughs> but it, I, I think it is, I, but I'm not absolutely sure, and therefore I, I'll only suggest this, that it might be Augustus and Tiberius, but I'm not sure. But any of the coin, very clear, I think you can see the DV Filius there on the left and so on, the inscription. Of course, Mark meant something different and ironic about that, uh, that uh, as well, I would say, but I'm just saying that in terms of, of, the, of local colouring, if we were to put it that way, there's nothing uh, uh, strange in any way that, uh, that, uh, that, uh, that the, the, the title uh, Divi Filius would be, would be known by a, Ro by a Roman centurion. Why he would use it for this, this uh, outcast martyr that he was watching die on the cross, of course, raises other questions. Such an atmosphere is both a challenge and a threat to all Jews, Jews both Jesus followers and non-followers alike. In the years leading up to the revolt, anti-Jewish pogroms broke out in all the surrounding cities, according to Josephus, and there were match, these were matched by militant Jewish reprisals. One might well ask, where would communities of Jesus followers stand in these circumstances? They were, uh, they were seen as dissidents, even traitors, within their own ethnic world. Yet they had a special reason for rejecting Rome's policies in the East, given the fact that their founder had been put to death as a criminal at the hands of Roman procurator. Thus they were faced with decisions about their own allegiances and how they might best express these in view of their loyalty to a leader who had enjoined love of enemy as one of his central ethical injunctions. So that's my attempt to paint the picture, if you like, that they were faced with between the years 
the death of Jesus and, and 70, when I think, as I say, Galilee and also the early Christian writing responses come into clear view. So we, I'm, I'm trying to kind of paint a picture of what, were this, what was going on and how might that, that reflect itself in any way. Does it suggest that a zitzim leben Galilea, so a situation in the life of Galilee, might prove an appropriate reading site in which to hear the messages of these two documents? So let me begin with Q. <laughs> Some people say that's very optimistic on my part. <laughs> but anyhow, uh, the problem with Q, of course, is, that the, is the fact of its very existence as a literary document continues to be debated, despite Herculean efforts of John S. Kloppenberg, a very no well-known and outstanding Canadian scholar. Two diametrically opposed positions can be, have been proposed with quite different implications for our discussion. On the one hand, Kloppenberg reconstructs Q as a literary work, written in Greek, and consisting of three different layers, Q1, Q2, and Q3, each to be assigned to different social situations spanning several decades from the 50s to the 70s. Uh, a very uh, enticing story, but I mean, a lot of people are, would be somewhat skeptical of the way in which he separates these layers uh, on purely literary grounds alone. On the other hand, our friend again, that man, Richard Horsley's views are supported by a number of scholars who adopt a much more flexible approach, viewing Q as essentially an oral collection, originally cir circulating in Aramaic. Not only are there differences about the scope and nature of the work, its, its intended function has also been variously understood. Horsley, as we've seen several times already, sees it as a document for uh, rest uh, restoring of community life uh, in Galilee that had been eroded, whereas for Kloppenberg, it seems to emanate from a rather more scholarly bunch of, of, of scribe, uh, scribe uh, people. But where he finds these people, I always have a great difficulty. Anyhow, I, I'm just telling you, I'm just reporting. <laughs> At best, one can, uh, at best uh, one can make a case for, uh, that Galilee provides a plausible locale for Q's rhetoric and Q's theology, is what Toppenberg says in the end. Uh, uh, on the other hand, Jonathan Reed, another uh, American scholar who has contributed greatly to the archaeology of Galilee, he argues that locating Q in Capernaum, for, uh, in Capernaum on the basis that what he regards as the central role ascribed to this place within the geographic world of the work. That's a quotation from him. Anyhow, we'll come back to all that. In the light of these and other problems associated with Q, not least the, the absence of any passion narrative in Q or any reference to the passion of Jesus, it might seem a futile exercise to summon it as a witness to Galilean Jesus followers. Yet despite the difficulties alluded to, there, there would be widespread acceptance of the fact that from a very early stage after Jesus' death in Jerusalem, some followers who were attracted to his itinerant lifestyle and prophetic stance sought to replicate this ministry in Galilee. And that these, <coughs> excuse me, that these are the original missionaries, or tradents, handers on, of the sayings of Jesus, which at a later stage were, in, were indeed translated into Greek and given a literary rather than a purely oral form. Unlike Kloppenberg, uh, I have argued that both a wisdom and an apocalyptic emphasis are combined in both Jesus' own worldview and in that of the first Q tradents, or, or handers on, of the tradition. When one examines a whole range of Jewish writings of the period, it becomes abundantly clear that, there are not, that these are not separate and discrete points of view, as in some ideal literary type. One has to think of the book of Daniel, of which the author is present with us, uh, Professor Collins, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> to see how mantic wisdom and apocalyptic visions are in no way deemed incompatible, uh, at least by the final editor of the book. A recently published document from Qumran, 4Q Instruction, uh, likewise combines the most commonplace wisdom style admonitions about growing crops, etc., with knowledge of the, the, myst, quote, the mystery that is to be, a phrase that occurs some 22 times in the work and clearly identifies this mystery as an understanding of the cosmic reality and the deeper meaning of life. So in other words, uh, I think this idea of, of having a, a purely um, um, a wisdom layer and then an apocalyptic layer, as were put on later, I, I don't think that's right. I think the mix is there and is part of the Jewish literary tradition and also the Jewish religious tradition. And there's nothing incompatible, it seems to me, in terms of the worldview of both the wisdom and an apocalyptic worldview. How then are we to understand Q in the context of turbulent history of Galilee in the period after Jesus' death? What are the continuities and discontinuities between Jesus and the Q, Q tradents, and what adaptations were called for in the light of later difficulties facing Galilean Jesus' followers? As already discussed in a previous talk, Jesus of Nazareth makes an interesting contrast with his namesake from Jerusalem, Jesus ben Sirach. 
The latter belonged to the elite scribal class associated with Jerusalem, deeply conscious of his own position of influence in the councils of rulers of kings, a role which contrasts sharply with other various types of, types of craftsmen or tectones, whose work was necessary, as he puts it, to keep the fabric of the world intact. Jesus of Nazareth came from precisely this latter background, a tecton, or the son of a tecton, from an obscure Galilean village. The tenor and range of images in Jesus of Galilee's teaching, parabolic, pithy, proverbial, reflects the nomic wisdom of the peasant, based on their experience of coping with, li with life's struggles. Yet while clearly tapping into this rich source of human insight, Jesus develops his own distinctive voice. I may not have made this point as clear yesterday as I should have. His wisdom, though proverbial in style, is subversive in content. His wisdom, though proverbial in style, is subversive in content, as the strange outcomes of the plots in his parables demonstrates. These innocent-sounding simple stories, uh, proverbs and comparisons, reflected the everyday social life of the region, are packed with surprise and irony. They challenge the addressees to hear and see the world differently from their everyday expectations and fears. The God that Jesus proclaims and dares to call Father is a kind of householder God. Jesus elevates the wisdom of everyday experience into the language that is appropriate for speaking about the God in whose name he was called to proclaim the presence of God's coming reign. The presence of God's coming reign. Anyhow, as employed by Jesus then, the wisdom orientation of his teaching presupposed a deeper knowledge of God and his ways in the world. His gnomic wisdom is grounded in his sense of the knowing, knowing God intimately, uh, like the 4Q text, the knowing the, both everyday things, but also knowing the mystery that is to come, the mystery that is to be, uh, revealed wisdom. The few indications we get of his inner life, of Jesus' inner life, suggest that, he, that the active and contemplative are intimately bound together. Famous Johanna in Logion, as it's called, or Jubel Roof, I thank thee, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, is the prayer of any pious Jew, echoing the opening verses of Genesis. Yet the claim that follows this opening statement has the ring of the seer to whom God has revealed the hidden mysteries of life. All things are given to me by my Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom he has chosen to reveal him. That's Luke 10, uh, Matthew 11, it's an early Q saying. The transition from the remembered Jesus of the past to the risen Jesus of the present is seamless, as gnomic wisdom and apocalyptic vision come together naturally, both having their source in the creator, in the creator God's benevolence towards the creation uh, and desire to make it good again. The prayer, this prayer, a jubel roof or song of exaltation, also includes the tradents who understand themselves as participating in Jesus' intimate knowledge of God in the world, those to whom he has chosen to reveal them. They, they, as it were, announced themselves in that little uh, phrase. And it was to this, on this basis that they felt enabled to name Jesus as wisdom herself. Wisdom is justified or vindicated by her children, pro probably, or Matthew has it, by her deeds. The allusion to Lady Wisdom, Hakma Sophia, is personified, uh, uh, a personified partner with God's, uh, God according to Proverbs chapter 8, points to a creation rather than to an exodus, uh, 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 than the exodus as the ground of Jesus' followers' belief in his role within the, the, within the divine plan. It underpins their confidence in the goodness of God and explains the freedom from care about the necessity of, of life that he had enjoined on them. Uh, the creator God, God's care is universal. He makes his sun to shine on the good and, good and the wicked, and his rain to fall on the just and the unjust alike. Such confidence underpinned their lifestyle and their readiness to imitate Jesus' own behavior. If the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head, then they too must be on the road. The Gentiles could be included in the coming banquet, even if the focus and hope was still for the regathering of the twelve tribes of Israel. This hope had a particular resonance in the north, as we've mentioned several times already, whose tribes had been deported by the Assyrians in the 8th century, and for whom there was no return, unlike their Judean co-religionists who did return from the exile in Babylon three centuries later. What direct effects had Galilee on the Q movement then? The fact that we can plausibly suggest a continuation of the Jesus movement in the region after his death suggests that initially, at least, there was no witch hunt against them in Galilee. The absence of any explicit reference to Jesus' trial and crucifixion in the collection, in the collection may suggest a strategic rather than a theological decision, as some have claimed. Some have claimed, of course, that Q, is such a, that Q has been exploded into now a whole new tradition, if a theological tradition, where, uh, where uh, quite different from the, the cross theology of Mark and the synoptics. But I'm, I'm not so sure about that. I'll come back to that in a little bit later on. Uh, 
the, light, uh, the likelihood of rejection is clearly indicated. The wisdom of God says, I will send uh, them prophets and apostles, and some of them they will kill and persuade uh, and persecute uh, like the prophets of old. That's Q 11, um, Luke 11, 49, Matthew 23, 34. Both, both redactions of that saying have, have different, as were, uh, touching up, associate, you can easily associate with each evangelist, uh, but at the same time behind it is the expectation that these people who would continue Jesus' mis- ministry would be, would be persecuted like the prophets of old. The mention of the three Galilean towns, Karazin, Bethsaida and Capernaum, gives a local colouring to a collection that otherwise has a fairly general appeal and tone. Uh, unlike Jonathan Reed, however, who sees the reference to Capernaum as indicative of where the Q community had settled, I inter- interpret the, the woes uh, uttered against these places as reflecting the rejection of the Tridents, and they're moving on. Perhaps they had operated from th- th- that base initially, and maybe that, that if, as Reed suggests, and as we've seen in the early uh, slides, there was a settled Jewish Christian group in the place, it was they who had rejected the more radically minded Jesus followers. The stance and attitude of the tridents of the Q material would scarcely be acceptable to other Jews who did not follow or accept the claims of being made, being made about Jesus. In view of the increasingly inward-looking attitudes of Galilean Jews, as we've seen in the Ber- Berlin's uh, work, for example, and others as well, uh, of the period, uh, these people would, would, would be seen as threatening the ethnic and religious solidarity of the majority. Uh, they respond by uttering woes on these towns in the name of Jesus thereby introducing the judgmental dimension of the apocalyptic worldview that they shared with him. As yet, one can find no trace of the imminent clash with Rome on the horizon, but the mention of the fate of Tyre and Sidon being less severe than that of Capernaum in particular is not just a matter of using a Gentile city for shaming a device against a Jewish town. The Phoenician coastal cities belong to what I have elsewhere described as the Restoration Map, one that included the whole territory from the Mediterranean Sea to the Euphrates. Though, uh, thus, the conversion of these cities uh, could, be, uh, could be hoped for also. Perhaps an outrage even to these cities and other places that were mixed in terms of Jew-Gentile inhabitants was the catalyst for a move northwards, one that was less hostile to the Gentile world than the more conservative Jews who became involved in the bitter hostilities of the immediate pre-revolt period that I referred to already. At any event, it seems that the rejection at, at Jesus' home place meant a transition for the Q group. In my opinion, it was such a situation that it may have led to the translation of the sayings of Jesus into Greek and their codification into a literary genre of the sayings of the wise, a form that would, be still, uh, would still be sufficiently flexible to have gone through several alterations and additions over time, as Kloppenberg has tried to suggest. Are we, are we to suppose that the urge to imitate literally the st- lifestyle of Jesus gradually waned as the first generation of Tradents passed on? At all events, as a, as a document, Q was in danger of being lost, had it not been for Matthew's and Luke's desire to integrate it into their more developed accounts of Jesus' life, and use its instructions as teaching on the nature of Christian discipleship for their more settled communities. Mark's encounter with Q is an interesting question that we'll come, we'll come to later. Now, so I move, that's my first attempt at reading Q within the context of the Galilean disturbances of the period and so on, and seeing, uh, if you like, a a missionary movement of a prophetic style following Jesus' own uh, lifestyle, and uh, involving danger, uh, uh, um, involving rejection, and so on by by their, their own contemporaries, even contemporaries within the Jesus movement itself. So now, how about Mark, a Galilean gospel question mark? And I'm very conscious, again, of being in the presence of somebody who knows far more about Mark's gospel than, than I do, namely uh, Dr. Adela uh, Yabra Collins, who's a famous uh, and outstanding uh, uh, commentary on the, on the gospel. However, I'll, I'll, I'll plow ahead and we'll see what the conversation will bring up later. Uh, early patristic tradition suggests Rome as the place of comp- composition of the Mark and gospel, and some modern scholars have stoutly defended this location. Yet others have sought to shift the location to the east, and specifically to Galilee, following the lead of Ernst Lohmeyer's 1947 study, Galilea on Jerusalem. He took as his starting point the different locations of the post-resurrection appearances to the disciples, noting in particular the absence of any appearance in Jerusalem in Mark's account. Instead, the earliest gospel gives instructions for Peter and the disciples to revert to Galilee, there to encounter the risen Jesus as he had foretold them, Mark 16:7. However, Lohmeyer notes that in fact Mark does not report an appearance in Galilee subsequently, and that therefore the seeing in question must refer to the parousia. 
The mention of Jesus having previously instructed them about a future encounter in Galilee clearly refers back to Mark, Mark 14, 28. This verse, however, promises neither appearance nor parousia in Galilee. Rather, Jesus declares that after his resurrection, he will lead them, pro axo, pro ago, I'll go ahead of you to Galilee, uh, uh, predicting at, uh, uh, their dispersal after his arrest with the words of Zechariah 13, 7. I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be dispersed. For Lomar, this promise can only point to the later Jesus community in Galilee, expressing its belief that the risen Jesus was with them on their journey from the resurrection to the parousia. The so-called little apocalypse, Mark chapter 13, is crucial for any attempt to date and locate Mark. There's a growing agreement <clears throat> that this chapter reflects the situation surrounding the Jewish war, as described by Josephus, rather than Nero's persecution of the Christians in Rome in 64. Uh, those who uh, favoured a, a Roman authorship for Mark and Roman location of the Gospel would have seen the persecution of Nero in 64 as a background for, it, for some of the discussion about su suffering and so on that, would be, uh, that the disciples of Jesus would, would uh, be subjected to. If in, fact, if in fact Mark has the Jewish revolt in mind, the question is what precise point in the events does the chapter reflect and how might this assist in locating the Gospel and its audience more precisely? Without going into the details of their arguments, I find the suggestions of both Joel Marcus, uh, he's a professor down in uh, Duke University, and Gerd Tyson, a uh, German pr professor now retired in Heidelberg, I find their, their suggestions persuasive, namely that Mark's gospel was written immediately after the destruction of the temple in 70 and probably written in Syria. Both opt for Syria rather than Galilee, in the narrower sense, as passages such as Mark 7, 2-3 presuppose a partly Gentile rather than a strictly Jewish audience. That's where uh, the author feels he has to explain to his readers what the Jews do, what kind of ritual practices the Jews do, suggesting that there are some at least in the audience who don't know this in detail and he needs to inform them about it. Uh, in arguing for the post-war day, Tyson develops a highly interesting picture in terms of Mark's end-time scenario. On the one hand, he notes, Josephus described a scene of frightful disorder throughout the cities of Syria in terms of the persecution of Jews and Jewish sympathizers, which thus might explain the warnings about suffering for Jesus followers that Mark has included in chapter 13, verses 9 to 13. At the same time, there are indications that rumors of an imminent, world-shattering event were circulating in the East, and that these were being associated, for propaganda reasons, with the arrival of the Flavian Emperor Vespasian uh, in 69. That was the year of the three emperors. Vespasian, who had been the, governor, the general in the east, now, is now acclaimed as the, as the Roman emperor, leaving Titus, his son Titus to finish off the campaign in, in Judea. This would explain then why there is an air of anxiety running through Mark 13, which the promise of the soon return of the Son of Man was intended to assuage. The coming of the Son of Man in, Ma in Mark 13 is not for judgment, as in Mark, but rather to gather the elect from the four corners. The suggestion of southern Syria as a likely place of composition does not necessarily imply that Mark is a purely Gentile gospel or that the concern for Israel's conversion and restoration had diminished by comparison with Q. Indeed, in light of Lomar's suggestion about the import of Mark 1428, uh, discussed earlier, namely, I will, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be dispersed, the Markan community must have considered its first task was to regather the scattered sheep. Uh, <clears throat> Stories such as the Gadarene demoniac and the Syrophoenician woman might appear to suggest a Gentile rather than an Israelite perspective. However, as we discussed yesterday, I've argued uh, rather that it, it, uh, it retains the Jew-Gentile divide by Jesus' refusal to, at first, uh, first request to grant her her request of healing for a child. In, and that story, uh, then, the story of the Syrophoenician woman, uh, contrasts with, with the ready endorsement of the centurion, the pagan centurion in, in the Q document, that is Luke chapters uh, 7, 1 to 10. Perhaps the tight, uh, heightened tension of the revolt period explains the mark and reserve with regard to opening out to a non-Jewish person. The choice of the twelve, rich in the symbolism of Israel's restoration, as we've seen, is situated by Mark immediately after the summary statement of the crowds who flocked to Jesus. Mark 3, 7 to 12, Mark 3, 13 to 19. These came predominantly from the recognizably Jewish areas of the land. I think I have the text up here, yes. Je Jesus' followers came from Jewish and pagan territories. Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great crowd from Galilee followed. Also from Judea and Jerusalem and Edomia, and from beyond the Jordan. I, Jordan, I take that phrase, beyond the Jordan, as Peri, Peria, just. It was a, known as an administrative district in the Roman period. And then, and from Tyre and Sidon, a great crowd, hearing all that he did, came to him. 
That looks to me like kind of an addition. I, I mustn't leave out the Gentiles either. But I, there, he's, he's, focus, he's focusing, if you like, it's, it's setting up the context in which the election of the twelve will be, will be, will be announced immediately following this passage. So we have a kind of a, a context in which we have both a Jewish, uh, the Jewish uh, audience coming from these different administrative regions of the land and some pagans and from Tyre and Sidon. So it seems to me that that's, giving, that's putting the election of the Twelve into that larger context, if you like. The fact that Jerusalem was singled out from Judea for special mention in 3.8, uh, the, uh, from Judea and Jerusalem, uh, Jerusalem being in Judea, uh, is surely significant and gives a lie to the claim that Mark reinscribes the Galilee Jerusalem opposition that some have sought to impose on both Q and Mark. The widow in the Jerusalem temple provides Mark with a potent sem- symbol of the way this central institution should function as a point of gathering, a house of prayer for all nations, for Jew and Gentile alike. Unfortunately, it had been made a den of thieves. A description that seems quite apt for Josephus' report about the behavior of the different factions attempting to control the temple in the immediate pre revolt period. Just on the slide. Oh, oh. Maybe. Yes, here we go. Trouble in the temple. Eliazar, son of Ananias, the high priest, a very daring youth, persuaded those who officiate in the temple services to accept no gift or sacrifice from a foreigner. There, thereupon the principal citizens assembled with chief priests and the most notable Pharisees and appealed to the revolutionaries, saying that this was introducing a strange innovation into their religion, laying the city open to the charge of impiety if Jews were to be the only people to allow no alien the right to sacrifice. That's quite an interesting one, isn't it? Uh, <clears throat> the previous thing, of course, was my little own picture taken when I was in last visit. Uh, it hadn't been there before. Just at the foot of the of the, the uh, where the um, the Wailing Wall is, you get this uh, really collection of stones, really from uh, uh, from um, uh, the, the Herodian period, uh, the Ashlars of Herodian Ashlars. So it, it's a very uh, uh, poignant. Uh, uh, indicator of the of Jesus' own saying, "Not not one stone left upon another." I was really moved when I saw that. Uh, that yeah, okay. Now, uh, <clears throat> so the the, the Josephus thing uh, saying that they're 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 getting very uh, uh, anti-Gentile and so on. There's, a, there's this this very narrow narrowed uh, focus that we found in among Galilean Jews also here in in Jerusalem itself. And now we get, on the other hand, the text that, Jesus, that Mark and Jesus quote from, foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord and to be his servants, everyone who keeps the Sabbath and does not profane it, these I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifice will be accepted on my altar, for my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Isaiah 56, 6 to 8. The, uh, <coughs> Um, just let me pick up my, my text here now. Um, yes, Mark saw that, uh, that uh, Mark saw what, uh, sorry, the way forward Mark saw was to include Jews and Gentiles in the one household which is emerging elsewhere. Uh, I refer here to Mark chapter 3 where the notion of Jesus uh, in a house with a group of disciples, male and female surrounding him uh, is, is an important image if you like for the kind of community that uh, would emerge in the Mark, uh, behind the Markan uh, gospel. Mark's myth-making was one among several responses to the crisis of identity that was suddenly thrust upon all who had any affiliation with Jerusalem and its temple. No collection of wise sayings could adequately explain this crisis caused by its destruction and the apparent shaming of the God who dwelt within it. Mark was seeking to build healing bridges between the past of Jesus, the present of his own mixed community, and the future of the eschatological dream, which was reinforced by the figure of the returning Son of Man, not to judge, but to gather his elect from the four corners. His narrative account that predicted the, the destruction of the temple, despite its magnificence, suggests that replacement of a different kind was possible. The charge against Jesus reported in the trial, whereby he was accused of destroying this temple and building another not made with hands, was a hint that the Jerusalem temple's symbolic importance could indeed be replaced. The mention of the rending of the temple from top, uh, the rending of the, the veil of the temple from top to bottom at the moment of Jesus' death points to the fact that the holy place had already lost its symbolic role long before the Romans had intervened. If the Ahad at Qumran uh, could imagine several different temples, including one built by God himself, or, according to 11Q temple, or identify the community literally as a temple, 1Q rules, uh, 5, 
There is no reason to doubt that the Palestinian Jesus followers could use uh, their own religious imagination to envisage Jesus as inaugurating such a project also. Unlike the separatist Qumran group, however, entry into this temple did not demand ritual cleanness by strict Jewish standards, standards but could, be, could include Gentiles also, as indeed Isaiah had envisaged. In addition to the prediction of suffering and persecution, Mark 13 also uh, raises the question of the coming Messiah, warning against those who might claim that role, deceiving, if possible, even the elect with signs and wonders. One cannot but hear in this warning a reference to what Josephus describes as the sign prophets, a number of whom appeared in Judea in the period before the revolt, proclaiming the imminent advent of divine vindication by recalling the reenacting of the salvific events of Israel's past. Several of these had been brutally put down by the Roman procurator, and the implication would be that Jesus' followers should not imitate these misguided prophets by joining such groups. Their Messiah was different. Their Messiah was different. His way was one of patient acceptance of rejection in the hopes of future vin in vindication. Uh, yes. Impostors, this is Josephus again, Impostors and Josephus called on the crowd to follow them into the desert, for they say... Uh, for they say they would show them unmistakable marvels and signs that would be done in harmony with God's design. It's one, of, one example, just. Uh, take heed that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying I am he. And false Christs and false prophets will arise in many, uh, and show signs and wonders to lead astray if possible the elect. There are other possible in, in, in our... In our community tensions reflected in these sayings, warnings also, as is well known, Mark's gospel is dominated by the idea of the messianic secret. That is, Jesus' refusal to ascribe the role directly to himself until the very end, and his silencing of those who sought to attribute it to him at various points along the way. Several suggestions have been made as the significance of this feature. The most plausible for me is the explanation seems to be that Mark wants to avoid the danger of ascribing messianic status to Jesus without taking full account of the crucifixion. For Mark and, and uh, the other evangelists after him, Jesus' messianic status was not based on his healing or teaching powers alone, impressive as these may have been. The transition at Mark 8.30 is significant in this regard. Peter had just declared that Jesus is a Christ, and Jesus immediately charges him to tell nobody about it, and goes on straight away to speak of the suffering that lies ahead for him, now designated as Son of Man rather than as Messiah. Uh, <clears throat> the fact that, Ma that Mark represents the chosen band of disciples uh, repeatedly misunderstanding Jesus' intentions is all too hum in all too human fashion suggests that this was an ongoing danger for the first century G Jesus followers in Galilee as elsewhere. Uh, <clears throat> again, several different explanations of this literary phenomenon have been suggested. But the most straightforward explanation must surely be that the heightened atmosphere of expectation about a divine intervention, both before and during the war, had raised questions for some as to the claims about Jesus' messianic status and had caused others to look for a more militant type of figure who would defeat uh, the enemy, uh, 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 Rome, and establish a powerful Jewish kingdom, and, uh, uh, following such writings as the Psalms of Solomon uh, uh, had described. Mark couches the warning against false prophets and false messiahs in terms of deception through signs and wonders. In addition to an extra textual reference to Josephus' signed prophets, this might well be an, inter an inner textual reference also to Jesus' own mighty deeds, which Mark describes often graphically in the first part of his narrative, thereby run running the risk of implying that Jesus was at some kind of Taya Saner or divine wonder worker who might be compared with Heracles or Asclepius. Such an impression of Jesus' identity needed to be balanced by that of a figure who was destined to suffer at the hands of the combined powers of the Jerusalem priestly elite and the Roman governor. And this transpires in the second part of the Markan drama. Only then, only when both aspects of Jesus' career, his popularity as healer and his rejection as a criminal, were remembered and integrated, could a proper understanding of his messianic status be appreciated and proclaimed. Mention of a possible identification with Greco-Roman divine figures already encountered in the immediate environment of Galilee, namely Heracles, Asclepius, and Dionysus, raises the intriguing possibility that these figures may well have played a role in the presentation of Jesus' public life that we see in Mark, especially as the movement crossed the borders into Phoenicia and Syria, where they were known as patron gods of various cities, as we discussed already. <clears throat> we know, I, I just I think I'll probably, just to remind you again, our pair, our pair having their drinking, there's a drunken Heracles, there are the two healers. And then the sweet wars of Galilee, I think we saw all that yesterday as well. I'll come to that just in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> now the point I want to make here is, we know the, se the second century, um, we know the second century pagan writers, for example, example Celsus, 
uh, made a comparison with these figures in order to denigrate Jesus, and that these were rejected with equal vehemence by Christian apologists such as Origen and Justin Martyr. It should be recalled that according to both Plutarch and Tacitus, the Jewish God was confused with Dionysus, especially because of the Feast of Tabernacles, which was celebrated during the grape harvest uh, period. It is not that the Gospel writers explicitly set out to paint our picture of Jesus in colours that evoke these demigods, whose biographies had, uh, had circulated widely in the eastern Mediterranean region for centuries, yet there are undoubted similarities, ranging from deeds of Her Heracles to the rejection and persecution of Dionysus, not to mention the legends of their miraculous births and apparent apotheosis that circulated in various forms. One can imagine a Jewish Jesus follower, such as Mark, being familiar with these popular uh, representations of the demigods. Uh, he therefore used a light brush to draw elusive yet contrasting pictures of Jesus to these other divine figures, known and honoured in the larger region. In support of such a claim, one might instance Philo of Alexandria's drawing on Dionysiac imagery in his description of the Therapeutae, who are said to drink, quote, as in the Bacchic rites, of the strong drink of God's love come together as in a single choir. The, the fact that such members of the Julio-Claudian line as the Emperor Gaius had imagined himself to be a new Dionysus, according to Philo, uh, might reasonably have prompted an early Christian writer opposed to Roman arrogance, as displayed in the humiliation of the Jewish nation, to subtly challenge su such examples uh, as part of a Christian apologetic. Yet, let the reader understand whether they be Jewish or non-Jewish. Well, I know I'm, again, up, up against the time, but I have just one very brief paragraph or two to read. The search for Galilean Christianity may have taken us to an enlarged or greater Galilee than that of the narrow confines of the Roman provinces described by Josephus. Yet this expansion corresponds to the hopes of territorial restoration of, uh, as these had been expressed in the Bible and repeated in later Jewish writings. I've repeated this several times already. I suggested that on the basis of an attempted correlation between internal indicators in the text and external circumstances in northern Palestine, a plausible case, uh, uh, both, uh, circumstance in Palestine, both preceding and immediately after the Jewish revolt of 66, a plausible case can be made for regarding both Q and Mark as emanating in that region of Upper Galilee, southern Syria. Thus, the Galilean dimension of Jesus' own life and ministry has carried over into the earliest literary productions of the movement that continued his memory and his name. I mentioned already that I would ask the question, what are the possibilities of the Q people visiting the Markham community? Is Mark aware of Q, but chooses not to incorporate it into his account, unlike his successors Matthew and Luke? If that were to be the case, can anything be read into his silence? The usual answer to this question is to claim that Mark did not know Q and that the few common items between the two works are best explained in terms of a shared oral tradition. Q is then seen as representing a very different theological perspective, uh, one that, as I say, has a very different orientation to that of the, uh, of the, the Pauline stroke Markan, one of the sacrificial death and so on. This conclusion would appear to be less than plausible to me, anyhow, uh, when one considers the focus of each work more closely. Q concentrates on Jesus' teaching, though it does know of his mighty deeds as well. <clears throat> Q, uh, Luke chapter 7 and Matthew 11 uh, can recount, uh, go and relate to John what you've heard and seen. The, the deaf walk, the dead, uh, the blind see, the deaf walk, the dead rise again, and so on. So in other words, a clear uh, awareness by, by Q of Jesus as a miracle worker. Mark, on the other hand, focuses on the mighty deeds in order to claim that Jesus was the real presence of God in the world now that the temple had been destroyed. Yet he repeatedly speaks of Jesus' teacher and his townspeople in Nazareth ask the pointed question, where did this one get this wisdom? So wisdom and mighty deeds are merely two different sides of the one story of Jesus' life and ministry as seen by both works. The emphasis on, uh, on one or the other aspect need, need not imply a conflict between them. As Burton Mack and others have suggested, uh, change circumstances uh, uh, of, of the times rather than different theological perspectives explain the genre choices and the emphasis of each work. This talk has been mainly about tracking Jesus' first followers in Galilee through the medium of two different early writings. Yet as suggested at the outset, our findings do have a significance that goes beyond a, a new take on early Christian history, if that were accepted, interesting as it might be. The importance of the local is integral to all Christian preaching and, and practice, even when a more universal outlook seems called for. 
This does not mean that Galilee is to be given the status of a sacred place, just because the region played such a vital role in the rise and spread of the Jesus movement. Rather, it implies that in the light of the career of Jesus of Nazareth and his first followers, each and every local situation and cultural expression is capable of being disclosive of God's universal care and presence in the name of Jesus. If the Christian witness is to retain its capacity uh, uh, for making a, a real difference in our world, this reaffirmation of the local is an important legacy of the Galilean Jesus and his first followers. So thank you very much again for your patience. I just, if I may, for one moment, I just had a few final slides that I stuck in here. I didn't even give them any, any title, I noticed. But this is a map of Dura Europus. I felt I wanted to do this in Yale because, of course, here in, in Yale you have some of the, the frescoes from a very early church house, which I had a privilege of visiting a number of years ago. It's just, um, I'm not sure can you see it, it's to the right of the main gate there uh, is the, the Christian church and the synagogue on the other side uh, of the main gate on the top. Uh, now, this is uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, reconstruction of the house and, the, and so on, the, the, uh, sorry, uh, the, uh, with the entrance doorway, uh, the courtyard stairs to the upper floor, baptistry, font, uh, Sunday school, as they call it, and then the church in the center. So it's, it's, uh, okay, sorry, I get out here. Okay, so there's one of, uh, of uh, just this one, the, the, um, the, the shepherd. The last sheep, bearing the last sheep, and finally a story from Mark: the paralytic being let down to the roof of the house. Rather nice one. Okay, thank you very much, and sorry for. Thank you very much, Sean Frayne, for this um, stimulating lecture. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions, for several reasons.